holy friends in Christ Jesus. Now we go to our scripture lesson for today that comes to us from the Gospel of Matthew. This is Matthew chapter 11, verses 16 to 19 and 25 to 30. We're, we're going to briefly talk about the skip between 20 and 24, but this section is a continuation of what we talked about last week with John the Baptist being in prison, sending his disciples to talk to Jesus, and this is a continuation of Jesus' response. This is the New Revised Standard Version. Hear these blessed words. But to what will I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to one another. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We wailed, and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, yet wisdom is vindicated by their deeds. On to verse 25. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. This is the word of God for the people of God, and thanks, thanks be, be to God. Holy friends in Christ Jesus, we're just going to continue straight on to what we were talking about earlier, last week. So, as I mentioned, this is a whole speech about John the Baptist. And what happened is John the Baptist is in prison, the disciples show up. Disciples of John, not the disciples of Jesus. They show up to Jesus in the middle of preaching and interrupt and say, hey, are you the real deal or are you, should we be expecting someone else? And in the beginning, John is talking about, or Jesus is talking about John the Baptist. He's saying, you know, were you expecting a reed shaken in the wind? Were you expecting this and that? But now he transitions how he's looking at the crowd. And he continues to talk about the, not just the doubt, but sometimes the misinformation of disciples. So as I was thinking about this week and reflecting these texts, I just want to be perfectly blunt with you. This text is not going to be fun for about the first third to two thirds. This is going to be a evaluation of our spirits and our minds and, our, and how we are as a community. And then we will talk about the fun verses. My favorite verse actually in this is 1128, come to me all who are heavy laden and I shall bring you rest. But first we gotta get through the bad stuff before we talk about the good stuff. So Jesus, apparently during this conversation, there has been a nerve that was struck because it's not just the Pharisees that he's talking about here, it's the disciples of his cousin, John the Baptist. We need to remember that they're cousins. It's his family who's doubting the Messiah, despite having every, I mean, as we get to the beginning of the gospel, we know that John the Baptist was the first one to reveal Jesus to other people who weren't married. As it says, he leapt for joy in the womb of Elizabeth. But moving on, he changes his perspective to the crowds and the doubting of John the Baptist. So in front of the crowds, he says this wonderful story that people have been trying to pick apart for years where he says, what shall I compare this generation to? Which is typically the beginning of a parable. And he says, it is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to one another. We called the flute for you and you did not dance. We wailed for you and you did not mourn. Let's talk about that for a second. Jesus is comparing the people right now of doubt and of fear like children in the marketplace running around and shouting to one another and singing songs and wondering why they're not getting the effect that they want, right? It says, we sang a song for you, but you did not dance. We weeped for you and you did not mourn. It's almost like there's this miscommunication. They say, the children are like, okay, th this guy's really gonna like this song. So we're gonna play this song and he can't hear it. Or maybe he doesn't like it the song that he is hearing and he just doesn't dance. Or the children sit there and they mourn and they say, look at us, we're so sad, but maybe the world is so busy that they feel like they can't reach the person that they're trying to hear. 
Now this could be taken in two directions. The first direction would be from the individual going out, right? Which is you are trying to show the gospel in some way, but for some reason it keeps getting knocked over the head. Something keeps falling short, something doesn't work, and we get frustrated because we're like, okay, well, this is how God speaks to me, so maybe this is how God speaks to everyone. And I will be truthful in saying that we are all unique people, and God speaks to all of us uniquely and differently. So sometimes the songs that we sing to one another we think are so powerful and bountiful, but just don't make the mark. Or sometimes when we cry and lament, sometimes we're crying and lamenting about the wrong things, the so-called first world problems that we all have today. Like even this morning when we talked about communion, right? About how are we going to do communion if we're wearing masks? Oh my goodness. And I was fully admitting I was getting a little worked up thinking about it. So I didn't hear my lament. <laughs> the, the other side of this coin is imagine somebody using their gifts for a community. Right? And we are on the other side. So somebody comes in and they're so eager and excited to share the message with the community of Christ, right? But it's ill-received. Maybe it's a child who is really excited because they got into band and they learned how to play the tuba. And they're ready to play the tuba for the Lord and they show up and it is the worst rendition of Amazing Grace you have ever heard in your life. And we don't accept it. And we don't embrace it. And we don't encourage the child to continue working forth and continue to improve his skills. We say things like, you know, that was a horrible song. And you really need to practice before you come back and play for us again. So too are our spirits, my friends. There's a reason that Jesus continually calls us infants over and over and over. And it's not just because we're small in the eyes of God. It's not just because we're his children but because sometimes we can get the wind pulled out of our sails really fast. So my brothers and sisters, that is our first lesson about this gospel, is sometimes it's okay to take a step back, take a breath, and just go with the flow. Just because something doesn't work the way that we anticipate or expect doesn't mean that there's not God working through it. To continue on, um, let me just briefly touch about 18 and 19, and then we'll get to the other section we're not talking about, because this kind of fits in as well. Because not only do we sometimes not accept what we hear or what we see, or sometimes we think we're doing the right thing and we're not, we have this objective in our minds to say that we, we're people who never want to be satisfied. If you'll notice in the United States, we are people who are always driving to get the next paycheck, to do the next job, to get more and more and more. And Jesus actually brings this up to us when he talks about, you know, John the Baptist shows up neither eating nor drinking, and they say that he has a demon. So then Jesus shows up eating and drinking, and they call him a drunkard and a glutton, somebody who's a friend of sinners and tax collectors. So what this teaches me as we go further on into 20 to 24 is that as a community, we can work together to see God's glory in a different way. Because 20 to 24 come to us about woe to the cities. And I can understand why they didn't want to bring this into the lectionary text this week, because it's all about how horrible these cities are and how they're no greater than Sodom and Gomorrah and how they deserve judgments on the final days. But let's, let's take a little bit of a side tour about that, because it's four city, or it's three cities. It's Chorazon, Bethsaida, and Capernaum that he's, these cities are talking about. It's not just Roman cities, it's also Jewish-centric cities as well. So as he's talking about these communities, what we learn is that it's greater than just us, right? We can talk about the community all we want as in Mount Vernon, or let's take it a step further. We can talk about the community as ourselves and our family. We can talk about the community as our family in Christ, but for some reason, there's this disconnect when we go to the greater community, right? Because what? Green County has at least over a dozen churches, if not more. And our church has two of them, <laughs> right? It's this idea that as we continue to expand outward, we start finding division where for some reason our faith communities don't want to play nice with one another. Perhaps we are singing a song that they're not receiving, or perhaps they're singing a song that we're not receiving. 
So this is even greater than simply us. It gets to the community of Christ and what's important about being in that community of Christ, which Jesus talks about. So as we get back further down into um, 25 through 28, you know, look at the time, or at the time Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have revealed these things from the wise and the intelligent and revealed them to the infants, right? For, yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. So here's the thing about all this uncomfortable text. We're finally going to shift to something more bright and happy. But similar to last week, as we become disciples, as we continue to figure out what it means for us, are we following his commandments? Or are we following some commandments that make us comfortable? Are we really seeing the sick? Are we seeing the hurting? Are we seeing the ones in pain? And that's not just physical, mind you. That's not just the people who are in the hospitals or the people that are waiting to go to the food bank or the people who are stuck on the side of the street, but the people who are emotionally damaged and in pain, the people who are working through emotional trauma or spiritual trauma. Are we seeing them? Are we acting towards the future that sometimes, as we know for ourselves, Sometimes the biggest wounds aren't the ones that are visible. But when we see others, we tend to forget that fact, that they probably have their own wounds as well. So the entire message, as we get towards the very end, we're finally getting there, is Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 tells us about burdens, right? Favorite verse in the Gospel of Matthew. Come to me, all who are heavy laden, and I shall give you rest. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. So here's a really cool transition as we've gone from verse 10, or chapter 10 to chapter 11. At the end of chapter 10, Jesus tells us, pick up your cross and follow me. Right? You go over there, you pick up your cross, and you keep going down the path with me. And chapter 11, on the other hand, Jesus says, put this yoke on, for my burden is light and easy to carry. It's this great transition because it goes from Jesus saying, all right, you know, you can carry this cross on your own. Everything is great. To Jesus saying, I don't want you to carry it by yourself. The burden is difficult. It's a hard thing to carry our crosses on our own. So let me use a yoke. And for us, not agriculturally knowledgeable, um, me as well. I had to do some additional research. But a yoke is an, a tool that is used for farming. Well, typically was used for farming before tractors and such. But is a tool kind of looks like a, kind of like a bull's horns, right? It's got like a little, like a, it's almost like a bow in a way. But but anyways, the point about it is this yoke was an instrument to put animals in and push them through a field so that they would stay straight and you could turn them and you could do all this stuff. You could control two animals to push say, a plow. And I think it's interesting that Jesus says, to get rid of our burdens, we need to go and put on a piece of farming equipment. He's saying, come to me who are weary and heavy laden, and I will put you to work. Come to me, all who are heavy and he are burdened and heavy laden, and I will put more burden on you, and we will keep moving forward. It, it sounds paradoxical to us as Christians, and especially us in the West, because we have this wonderful idea of saying that we want this pain-free life, right? We want this life that's comfortable and joyful, and we can do whatever we want, and everything is hunky-dory at the end of the day. However, what we find is that as Jesus is guiding us, again with that yoke, you need two animals to run it, so we are on one side and Christ is on the other as we continue to be guided, what we find is that perhaps the burdens, when we take them to the cross and we give them to Christ Jesus and obey his commands to love the Lord your God above all else and to love our neighbors, that those burdens don't seem nearly as big as they have been. Those burdens don't matter in the grand scale. They don't matter to us as Christians because we know what is important, our God, our family, and our community in Christ. So my blessed friends, I think this is the perfect Sunday to have communion with the heavy ladens and burdens that we have all been carrying and to remember what is important in life, to love our God above all else and to continue to seek out his will. And he wants his will to be done so well that he gives us direct guidance. 
He doesn't wait for us to pick up our cross and stumble and fall across the floor. He tells us and he says, come with me. If you follow my commandments, come with me and I will show you how to act. I will show you the ways to take and I will show you a path that all people can learn from because that's the thing that speaks to me most is a yoke is a tool used for farming. And what is the purpose of farming? To grow food, right? It's here to grow something, to make something new and something grand and something that has sustenance, something that can feed the community, something that can feed the family that makes it and everybody around. Because at this point in civilization, that's what farming is about. And even here in the United States, what? It's 1% of people in, in the farming industry feed 99% of everyone else. That's what we do as Christians. We walk the fields with one another. We see the hungry and we prepare food for them. We see the sick and we prepare medicine for them. We see the brokenhearted and we prepare just a simple conversation with them. The important thing of it all is to be laced with love. Now to continue on with the farming analogy, well, as we come here for Holy Communion, we have two things that started from the ground. We have two things that started in the dirt, in darkness and in grime, and they have been made into something grander, even just wheat and grapes. Both of those things grown together take time and effort to be able to grow from the ground. They start muddy and broken, and then they grow all the way up and they're beautiful. But then they're ripped out of the ground and they are threshed or they are milled or they are stomped upon feet and they are put again into a dark place for a while as we make the bread or we make the wine. But something is added to it to make that happen. For you see, if you just take a bunch of flour and a bunch of water and you put it in the oven, you're not gonna get bread. You're gonna get some kind of cracker because with this bread, it needs something special inside of it, which is of course yeast. Wine also needs yeast, my holy friends. Something living, something different, something alien to everything it ever knew is added to this meal to make it into something different. Perhaps the songs that we sing have been handing out saltine crackers when we should have been handing out loaves of bread. Perhaps the songs that we've been singing or the mornings that we've been having have been giving out rancid grape juice instead of giving out wine that could be used and drank and enjoyed with one another. And I think that's where our burdens come in handy today. To remember that we don't always get it right. And Christ knows that. And that's part of the yoke as well. Because when we stumble, we stop. Christ picks us back up and we continue on our journey. Amen?